Hello, and welcome to the Siemens Cinemaric online webinar series. Today, we'll be talking about shop turn setup and programming specific to turn mill B axis lathes. I'll be your presenter, Chris Pollock. I'm the head of the Virtual Technical Applications Center and a resource available for you if you have any questions specific to operation and programming topics. Before we begin, let's just highlight some of the things that we have coming up. Um, in April, we're going to be doing a part programming webinar specific to uh, shop mill um, in auto mode, so in process measuring. As well after that, we have some additional webinar contents that we'll be pushing out shortly. Now, all of our webinars can be found going to our main cnc for u website. So if you want to get back to some of the previous webinars posted, um, you can use the direct link, the CNC webinars link, or you can use our main website and drill over to the webinars section. Uh, additionally, you want to check out the CNC for u website for a lot of other extra material. There's all kinds of videos, tutorials. You'll find documentation and manuals there. It's a great resource for anything cinematic based While you're there, you can check out our CNC training offering. We offer in-person workshops or training classes at our TAC, or Technical Applications Center, in Elk Grove Village, Illinois. That's right by the O'Hare Airport. All of our classes are free of charge. You can come in and attend the classes. We have three different levels of operation and programming going all the way up to an advanced five axis level three class as well as a service and maintenance class. So take a look at the link. You can download the agenda and you can register right on the forum for these upcoming classes. Now today's content is going to be specific to our Siemens Cinemark A40 DSL control. There are some key functions in, that, in this context that is only really accessible or available uh, once getting to the 840D. A lot of the other topics we've done in the past kind of transcend um, work in both 828 and the 840. For here, this is specific. We're getting to a level of advanced functionality that's specific to the 840D control. So today we're going to be talking, as I mentioned, about B-axis technology lathes, or turn mill technology lathes. So we're going to look at the kinematics, kind of get your head around what do we mean by a B-axis, what do we mean by a turn mill machine tool. We're going to get into how do we handle the machine in an operation, a setup and operation scenario, setting tools, calibrating tools, that kind of stuff. And then we're going to look at a live programming example. It's going to go through all of the typical operations you would do when programming a machine with this kind of technology. From there, we're going to go start with some basic features and functions. Everything's going to be uh, around the shop turn, built-in conversational programming environment. But you'll find a lot of these a lot of these features and functions will mimic or, or, or ma uh, mirror the functionality we would be doing if we were writing a G-code program. Now. I always like to uh, reference before we begin where you can find some supporting uh, documentation on the topics we talk about in these webinar series. So this content of this topic, you want to look for the Shop Turn Operation and Programming Manual. You can find that at our supportindustries.com website or portal, we like to call it. So in there, generally, either have you search for the content name um, in this case, if you search for shop, shop turn operation and programming, you're going to find a ton of manuals or documentation there. So what I su would suggest is just write down or jot down the um, document number right there in the right side of your screen, the 6FC5398 number, and do the search for that. That's going to drill you specifically to the shop turn manual. If not, if you just look for shop turn, I would uh, just pay attention to the date of the manual. The manual we're referencing here is the 2008 edition. But in that manual, you're going to find a working with a B-axis chapter, and that's going to really support or back up a lot of the topics we talk about today. Not everything, but certainly, um, especially from the setup side the, uh, and the operation side, go and take a look at those features or, the, or those, those chapters, those sections. 
Now, additionally, this is a, a webinar kind of building on previous content, certainly building on some of the more entry-level shop turn webinars. But from an advanced perspective, this is specifically the next series up from a webinar we did on programming subspindle lathe. So if you haven't seen that webinar, I would certainly recommend going back to it, um, taking a look at it. You can find it right there under the CNC dash webinars website. And in fact, if you click on the turning, it's going to be the first one you see pop up. And then from there, you can view the recording or download it for viewing later. There's a lot of material that we're going to talk about here that I'm going to kind of jump over because we've talked about it in detail in the previous webinar. And there's a lot of stuff for us to get through. So I don't want to obviously spend time reiterating stuff we've already talked about. So again, if you haven't seen it, I would suggest going back and taking a look at that webinar. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about, and it's really kind of a little bit of a stigma right now in the industry, is what do we call this technology? Is it a turn mill? Is it a mill turn? Why is there confusion with this terminology? So originally, when this mixed technology style machine came about, there really was only one uh, configuration type that was leveraging uh, turning and milling, and that was really a lathe that we were incorporating this milling functionality. It's only been the last few years that motor technology has gotten to a point, specifically leveraging torque motors, where you can take a platter of a large five-axis milling machine and get it to run at RPMs where you could actually turn at. So since we're so proficient in both sides of the technology, we've actually started changing the terminology a little bit. So instead of calling everything a mill turn, we're specifically calling it what is the base technology of the machine tool built on. So if it was originally a lathe type of framework that milling has been added onto, and the base control or the primary technology of the control is a lathe that has had milling turned on, then it's what we refer to as a turn mill. In addition, if it was a milling machine frame that now has turning capabilities, and from the control's perspective, the primary technology is milling, and it has turning functionally add functionality added into it, then it's what you would refer to as a mill turn. At the end of the day, I mean, you could certainly refer to them as either or. It just gets a little confusing. You're not always necessarily sure what the base technology is. So that's why we've adopted uh, what we call turn mill or mill turn. So today, yes, we are specifically talking about a turn mill. It was a lathe with milling functionality added onto it. So what am I going to see when I finally get in front of the machine? What's going to be different than what I've seen in, in, in past configurations of the cinema control? Well, really, the biggest thing is the B-axis functionality, right? Other than that, the number of spindles, that would mirror a machine that has a main spindle, sub-spindle, and live tooling turret. So you're going to see the same number of spindles. Um, but here now we have a B-axis. From the physical configuration side, I now have a machine that has one primary driven spindle, just like a machining center spindle, and now I can program it through the B-axis orientation in any range of motion, generally about at least 180 degrees of motion, um, sometimes even more, 120, 130, so I can start to swing it around. Now, how does it configure differently than a standard traditional lathe with a, a normal traditional style turret? It's really where the reference kind of comes from. So the machine is all going to be referenced from the spindle. This is a, a pretty common commissioning method when you get to this advanced technology. So whether it's a main spindle, sub-spindle machine with a more traditional turret on it, or it's a B-axis lathe, everything's coming off the primary spindle face. With that being said, a fixed turret is going to work all of its offsets based off of a datum on the turret face somewhere relative to the turret body. And then all of your tool offsets are going to stack off that. In a B-axis lathe, that datum is actually the center of the B-rotary. And then there's a dynamic offset working in the background of the control that's managing what we call our kinematics. That's the makeup of the machine. And then what will happen is there's a known value that goes from the center of the rotary to the gauge line, which is generally the face of the spindle. And then all of your offsets are going to stack from there. So when you set up a tool, you're still going to see that the offset's going to be from the spindle face out. 
but the system is actually managing a value from the center of the rotary out. And that's how we can dynamically adjust as we start to rotate the B-axis around. So what am I going to see in a little more detail? This would be a very typical configuration of machine tool in this technology. So we have an XYZ driving that milling spindle around in space. Then we're going to have a main spindle. Could be called any number of different terminology. Each builder likes to kind of change what they call their spindles. So that's usually the first thing I do when I get in front of a new machine is just figure out what's the terminology that they're using. Is it S1? Is it C1? Is it some other number? Some, some builders like to always use the same terminology of the spindle locations. And then if your machine just doesn't have that type of spindle, like a, like a secondary uh, turret, let's say, then they just skip over that one. So that's a pretty common method, too. Now, when looking at the B-axis, it's important to start to kind of get your head around where is this B0, where does everything drive from? So if you look at the image on the right side, you can see this is a very, um, very typical configuration of setup for a B-axis lathe. And in this case, the primary B0 location is actually at 9 o'clock, so the position that you see that head sitting in, which is the primary tool position facing the main spindle. And then everything is going to drive relative to that offset. So if I want to tell this tool to swing down from 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock, I'm actually going to give it a B90 positive value. And she's going to rotate counterclockwise down to that position. If I want to get to the subspindle, I'm going to give it 180. So the biggest thing to kind of get around is where is it referencing the B0. Different builders can do different things, but this would be probably one of your more common methods of setting up these machine tools. Now, how do I start to drive this B-axis around through the interface screen? Well, what we've done was we've incorporated two additional fields that you're going to see in a bunch of our standard cycles and functions. So first, in TSM screen, where we should all be used to the TSM screen for allowing us to do tool changes, fire up our spindle, do stuff like that. Well, you're going to now see a what we call a beta field, which is that, that little B insignia, and then our, our Y field or our gamma field. So beta is going to refer to the angle that we're driving the B-axis to. And then gamma is going to refer to the spindle orientation of the live spindle for that milling spindle. So if we can imagine, or if we reference the right side image, I have a turning tool. And I want to start to orient that and then move it around in space. Well, certainly I can swing the B-axis with the beta field from 0, again, which is at 9 o'clock, swing it down. And then I can use the gamma, which is the orientation of the spindle, to then flip that insert around. So in my, my little right-hand view there, that right-hand turning tool, if I want to cut the outside of the part, I would leave it at some, some angle, probably 45 degrees or less, could be at 0. And I would leave my orientation of my gamma, or my spindle, at 0. But if I want to take that same tool and now come down the face of the part, I may want to invert it at an angle greater than 45, probably all the way to 90. But once I get out past that point, now my insert's pointing the other direction. This is a right-handed tool. So I spin my, my gamma around or my spindle around 180 degrees just by inputting a value of 180. And the system now allows me to put the tool in such a fashion where I can come down. What's nice about the system is it's going to track appropriately handle the spindle directions based on the orientation and also dynamically adjust for your tooling offsets based on this orientation. But you have to use the beta and the gamma fields to drive this. So let me, let me show you what I'm talking a little bit here. I'm going to transition over to Sinutrain. Sinutrain is our uh, machine tool control emulator. Obviously, I'm running this one on a PC, but the, the process would be the same. So now let's say, for argument's sake, I have a tool. It's sitting at the B0 or the beta 0 location. I've got a standard roughing tool in the spindle. And I want to see kind of what's going to happen. So I'm going to position this machine to a known location. So maybe I'm going to go to, I don't know, 300 millimeters. This one has to be metric. Obviously, it would be the same if we were running this thing in inch. And I'm going to wrap in the machine to this location. And I can't get quite get there. Oh, let's load up a work offset real fast. I don't have any offsets turned on. Okay. 
And now let's go to that position again. All right. So I'm sitting at 300, Z0, and if you can picture it, picture it in your head, the right-handed tool is pointing at 9 o'clock or at 0. Now, watch what happens to the numbers if I use the TSM field and type in a beta value of 45 degrees. So I'm swinging it down to basically that you know 7.30 uh, position, right? So I'm going to cycle start. The machine drives down to 45 degrees. But my physical position location changed. Now, the machine didn't move the linear axes. So this is a, a dynamic offset, but that's not a five-axis toolpath per se. But what it did do is it calculated, based on that move, where I would have to go to to get back to that zero point. So the system is automatically calculating for that. If I look at the actual uh, motion of the machine, nothing really occurred. So if I'm going to be sitting back here at a B0 and I look at my actual values, right, and I swing the system down, I'm going to swing it down. The actual values is showing what the motors are doing. I swing it down to 45. You see my display doesn't change. But the numbers did recalculate. So that's how we kind of track and we can automatically adapt for however I decide to set this tool. And it's all being driven by the fact that we have the swivel cycle on currently on this machine. That's what's tracking these numbers. This is our dynamic fixture offsets. What would have happened if I did the exact same move? So I'm going to go back to zero. If I did the exact same move, but I positioned it with the B-axis field here, well, if I drive it with a direct axis of B, she's not going to adjust anything. So you see my numbers didn't change. It all stayed the same. So you want to be very careful when you start to move these machines around and you're using these types of functionality that you're driving it through the beta and that gamma field because that's going to that's going to allow the rapid calculation of the tool offset. So now I can go back. Um, I'm going to want to be in a safe spot, obviously, before I tell it to move because she is going to swing that tool down. But that's what's going to start to track and allow the system to manage the point in space where you're sitting at. Okay. So. This is how I'm going to start to handle working with my live spindle with this beta and this gamma field. Now, when I build the tools, I'm going to build them, again, picturing everything is at that 9 o'clock location or that B0 location. So when you go to make a tool, just like you've made probably a thousand times over, building different tool configurations. Now, with a B-axis lathe, again, I'm going to think that the tool is sitting in that base zero location. So that's where my cutting edge orientation position is going to come from. So when I go to build that new roughing tool and I go to look at that first cutting edge option, that is that tool sitting at a B0 with the gamma or the spindle sitting at zero. So if I have a right-handed tool, I'm going to use that first option and that would be traditionally used for OD work. But now that I have a B axis and I can move things around, I'm not limited to just using that tool for OD work, right? I could use it pointed at the B, I pointed at 9 o'clock with a spindle orientation of zero for an OD you know, turn. But now I can index my spindle 180 degrees, take that same tool, and go right into a bore and do an ID turn. So that's what makes these B-axis machines so much more versatile. I can start moving this cutting edge around anywhere I want in space. Now, if I'm going to build the base orientation of the tool, say it's a left-handed tool, as my, you know, in this primary configuration, then I'd use the third orientation field over, which would be typically what I would have done for a boring bar. Now, the offsets, everything is going to work off of a gauge line. Um, typically, what you'll see in these machines is HSK 63 or some HSK uh, mount. So that means that the gauge line is truly coming off of the face of the spindle, because that's where an HSK contacts. Um, if you happen to have a Cat 40 or something, then you do need to just know where gauge line is, because in a Cat 40, gauge line is actually inside the spindle. Even on a big plus, even though they're contacting off the face, the true gauge line is still inside the spindle. But the offsets, so our WF and our LF, our length and our, 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 our length in Z and our offset in, in X, that's coming from that gauge line. And then the system is going to manage 
that distance that I mentioned earlier, which is the center of the rotary to the gauge line or face of my spindle. That's happening in the background. And that value is critical, because if you can imagine, we start swinging that B axis around. If I don't know that distance, I could never get come up with a proper calculation of where that tool is now that I kicked it down to 45 degrees. But that's the nature. So as you start to do some tool setup, you're going to see the offset values are going to be that distance. You could obviously have set these tool offsets up externally and just plug the numbers directly in. Now when we get to turning tools, that's going to be a little bit different, but it's certainly simpler, actually, because in this case, there is no X offset, right? It's a rotating tool. So everything's held concentric to the center of the spindle. So the only thing I have to give it here is going to be my projection or distance, that I1 field, distance from gauge line out to the tool tip, and then the cutter diameter. Now, when you build the orientation of the tool, you don't have to worry about all these different handed or, or you know, orientated live tool holders that you would have in a traditional um, turret because you're going to drive it around with the b-axis so everything's going to be built at that nine o'clock position so the tool is pointing towards the headstock and then you're going to swing the tool from a facing tool to a peripheral or od oriented tool to a back turn tool that's all going to be handled with the beta and the, the beta field and you don't actually even have to worry about gamma right because the tool's spinning so there's there's no worrying about orientating the the live spindle portion of it. So build all your drills, build all your end mills as if they're pointing towards a head socket, B0, and then let the system swing them around. Now, when you get to this more advanced technology, of course, you can kind of do more things. So there are some new tools that start to become available to you in this technology range. And one of the tools that's pretty neat is what we call a multi-tool. So a multi-tool allows you to have a single tool location, but it can handle up to multiple types of configurations. So here on the image on the right, you can see I got a holder, and it's holding two different types of turning tools, probably a roughing and a finishing tool, and it's even holding a threading tool. That's what we refer to as a multi-tool. Now, if your machine's configured for multi-tool capabilities, then you will see the option multi-tool in the selection under favorites when I go to create a new tool. And here, it's pretty simple. Really all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the multi-tool field. Once I go into create a multi-tool, I'm gonna give it a unique multi-tool name and tell it how many locations I want. Now, if I wanna be able to control the true orientation of each location, I'm gonna put a checkbox in the angle input field. Or if I leave the checkbox out, then it's gonna automatically set the uh, spacing between each tool to be a constant amount. Once I've created that, then I'm going to get a field where I'm going to see the multi-tool in a specific tool location. That's, in this case, I'm in pocket 10. And then I can build however number of cutting edges I told it, or number, however many of locations, shall I say. I told it within that multi-tool. And I build them like I'd build any other tool. But what's going to happen is when I tool change the multi-tool, I grab, you know, number one, the CNMG, or number two, the VNMG. It's going to go grab and bring in all of these tools into one shot into the spindle. So when you start to build these types of tools, let's kind of transition over and show you a little bit of what's happening. So again, as a, um, as a review, if I'm building standard tools, build it with the orientation sitting in the 9 o'clock position. So a standard right-hand OD tool, I'm going to use this first position. If it was a left-handed tool, I'm going to use the third position over. And my round tools are always going to be built facing the B0 location, and then you're going to swing them around appropriately. Now, when I get to multi-tools, here I have a couple pre-built, or I can create one. I'm just going to go down to a new location, and when I hit new, if I have it, I'm going to see the multi-tool field. That's also what this MT column means. So a lot of times you might see that your machine has MTLO. You're not quite sure what it's referring to. It's referring to multi-tool capability. You have to have a positionable spindle for this to work, however. So select multi-tool, say OK, tell it how many locations we're going to want, give it some kind of a unique name, so I'll call mine multi-tool number three. If I want to type in the angles or not, and then say OK, and it builds the multi-tool and you get these three different locations. And these are physical locations that are all tied to the same tool. So now 
it's going to be the same process. Maybe I'm going to make a left-hand tool. So I'm going to call mine a CNMG. I like my caps to be on. It's my MG, I don't know, 331. Well, I'll call mine whatever, and then I build the tool from there. And then you would certainly build up the other the other locations. When you tool change it, you're going to pick the name of the tool like you normally would, and then it's going to automatically go grab the multi-tool and then orient the spindle to this location number. So that's the multi-tool function. You're going to start to see the multi-tools become much more popular in this type of configuration because certainly it saves um, tool change locations. You know, turret locations or tool changer locations. I get three tools in one pocket of my tool chain. Okay. So transitioning back, now that we've kind of talked about the setup and the creation of tools, the next thing would be setting my work offsets. Um, so this is going to follow that previous webinar I referenced, the subspindle, main spindle machine. So here I'm going to set up two different work coordinates. I'm going to have a primary work coordinate at my main spindle, spindle on the left. And then I'm going to set up a secondary work offset. In my case, I'm going to use a G55, 54, 55 for my subspindle. And that one is going to be the one that has the mirror function in it. And the mirror is very important because not only is this now going to manage the Z direction like it did in the previous webinar that I showed, but the system's also going to handle the beta and the gamma orientation that you're going to start to see when we write a part program. So I can still methodize everything as if it's on that main spindle. And then when I apply it to the subspindle, it'll calculate the appropriate orientation angle has to drive the B-axis to, what it has to do to the live tool as far as positioning of my gamma. And then additionally, where the work offsets are, what direction the Z is moving in. So all that's being handled just by a simple mirroring of the Z-axis. So it, it dramatically reduces the complexity of programming, switching between main spindle and subspindle and all that kind of stuff. Now, when you're using this method, it's very important that your machine is set up properly, um, set up properly specific to the work holding. So we're going to want to make sure that we have the accurate information sitting in this Chuck spindle data that's underneath the setting data in my offset table. And that's going to stack all these offsets. And we went through this again in a lot of detail in the previous webinar. So just make sure you kind of reference that. You got to make sure that the Chuck body and the jaw projections are all known here. Because especially when we go to do the handoff and then start working on the back counter spindle, it's going to use all these numbers to calculate. And it'll actually write the work coordinate for 55 for you. You don't even have to touch it off. But you do need to have some valid numbers here for this all to work properly. Now, when we get to setting tools, you as well have the beta and the gamma fields, just like we looked at in the TSM screen. So here, make sure you either leave the tool at the orientation it was in after tool change. Or if you need to move the tool, you don't move it with the hand wheel. You don't move it with the, um, the, the position screen, you drive it to location using the beta and the gamma field. I can't stress that enough. Now, we do have a couple arrow, arrows, and the arrows are just a quick input. So what will happen is if I have the arrow pointed to the left, that's going to be just telling the, the beta to go to that zero base position. If I have a down arrow pointed, it's going to go to 90 degrees of the B axis. And if I have a right arrow, it's going to go to 180 degrees. So those are just shortcuts to be able to flip this thing around a little bit. And the, uh, certainly the gamma is going to be the positioning of the spindle. So um, the zero and the 180 are automatically going to propagate there. Or if I choose the blank one, then just like the blank in the beta, I can type in whatever angular value I need. And then from there, it's just going to touch off like any standard tool would. Come down, come to a known diameter, take a light little cut, mic it, plug it in in the X0, whatever diameter I'm on. And now you've just touched off that tool. And the system taking into account, obviously, the distance from B rotary center to gauge line. It's going to plug in that value, like we looked at earlier, from the gauge line to the tooltip for you. I can do that as well in my Z, again, using the beta and the gamma fields. And then I could be touching to a workpiece if I'm using the reference point workpiece option. Or we also have the ability of touching off to the main spindle or the main chuck or the counter chuck. So in this case, we want to see you come over and bring the tool physically touching 
the chuck face, not the work holding face. So if you looked at, again, those two stacked offsets that we're showing you for the chuck body and the clamping, you're going to touch off to the face of the chuck body. And when you choose that, it automatically does the calculations for you. Now, certainly if you have um, presetters, you can just drive off the presetter and, and that all gets handled in the, in the back end for you. This would be, this would be what, how I would be doing it if I want to do it manually on the machine. So now that we got the machine basically set up, we've driven it around a little bit, and we kind of get an idea of what's happening from the operation perspective. Now let's start to look at the part programming. So for us, we're going to do a simple part programming example. I want to just, again, intentionally, I made this pretty basic from a geometry standpoint. We're going to use some standard turning cycles, facing cycles. But this is all about how are we manipulating the tool with the B axis. So we're going to come in. We're going to turn an OD boss. That's going to be the boss on the right side view. And then on that right side, or while it's clamped in the main spindle, we'll eventually do some slotting, some drilling, some peripheral drilling, some face mill on the peripheral, flipping back and forth. Then we're going to transfer the part over. Then we're going to do some back operations. So we're kind of going to break it down. I'm going to do it a couple steps. So we're going to start with a basic OD turn and then transfer our part and then do a, a, a back turn on it just so you can kind of start to see how I can move a turning tool from the main to the sub or counter spindle. And then we're going to go back and we're going to add some primary features to that first operation section before I transfer the part. And at the end of the day, we'll have a complete, complete part machined. The goal is to not only obviously get you comfortable with how we're handling the B axis in a facing or peripheral orientation, but, but when we get to the later operations, we're going to then create inclined planes and then start drilling or milling relative to an inclined plane. And this is where the power of the B axis really starts to become evident. So we're going to go in, we're going to create a part program like we normally would. We're going to jump over to our program manager. Once we're there, we're going to use the shop turn programming functionality to create this part program. If you are a G code programmer, and I will do this webinar in the future specific to G-Code, but a lot of the functionality we're talking about here, if you're doing any cycles at our control on the G-Code side, this is going to be mimicked or mirrored, let's say. Um, so the swivel cycle in G-Code, cycle 800, is the swivel cycle that you're going to see. So it's, it's, there's a lot of good topics here, so you can kind of apply what we're talking about today even to a G-code program, because the functionality and the methodology is really going to be the same. So we're going to go in, we're going to start our program, and the first thing we're going to build or, or create is our header page. And in the B-axis technology world, there's really nothing new or unique to the B-axis, per se, when you come to the header page. This is all kind of mimic just dealing with a machine that has a main spindle and a sub-spindle. So the describe functionality, um, the ability of obviously controlling multiple spindles from a max constant surface feed perspective, and then the Z2W field or staging of the sub spindle or the counter spindle. Um, that's all going to be handled. We're not going to see anything unique to the B axis until we get in and start to do some physical operations. So first, let's start a program and then we'll build our header page. So, I want to go over to Program Manager, come over to Pro Program Field, and let's, let's create a program. Here I have a, a bunch of ones that we were fooling with before. I'm going to get rid of some of these. We don't need all these programs done. All right. So I'm just deleting a few, making some space. And I'm going to start a new program. I want to do a shop term program. Give it a name following my standard rules, letters, numbers, and underscores, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, I'm going to call mine sample one, say OK, and we're in our header page. So like I just mentioned, there's really nothing unique here. Um, if you're at all comfortable with driving a machine with the subspindle, these are going to be the same features and functions. So the describe for the primary work offset, if I have a, if I have a known value that that part is sticking out. Again, this would be the total offset from spindle face all the way out to the work offset. I could plug it here. Just be careful with this because this is going to overwrite whatever's sitting in the work offset in my uh, offset table. 
So if I come back out here and I go to my work offset, and my G54 has 175, if I don't put that value, if that's truly what I want my work offset to be in this described field, then it's going to get overwritten. So be careful with that. Generally, I don't usually use the describe function for my um, main spindle unless uh, I'm in an example where I'm doing heavy production and I want to keep from the potential of an operator maybe stepping on an offset, then I can just let it, let it rebuild it each time. But if I'm running the machine and I, I know I'm going to come over and, and, and touch the front of my part and set my work coordinate accordingly prior to running the program, I don't want to use describe. Set up my stock. In this case, I get a basic 100 millimeter blank. Part's 150 millimeter overall. We're going to stick 75 out for the first clamping, and then we'll grab it and we'll have a 75 mil for the next clamping, just keeping things pretty simple. Basic retract values, I'm just going to have a, an incremental 5 millimeter retract. Safety position for tool change point. So this is a, is a value that I like to get very visual when I'm out on machine on. I'll pre-position the, the tool in a safe location. When you get to these B-axis machines, I certainly want to think about the swinging of that B-axis, maybe with the longest tool potential. I want to try to get as far away. You know, some of these machines get pretty compact, so you've got to be careful starting to swing things around. So here I'm going to use a value based on the machine coordinate system. I'm driving the machine to 550 mil and Z of 750. And really that's just going to be, again, this is a machine coordinate value, so it's based off my spindle face. This machine has 600 millimeters of max travel in X, so I'm a little bit off that. And this machine, I think, is somewhere around 1,400 millimeters in the Z, so I'm basically centering my Z axis. You're going to know once you have work holding stuff on what is an optimal place. And you can always jog the machine's location, just use the teach function to teach it in. What's my safety clearance? Certainly my max RPMs. I'm not too worried about it for uh, our webinar virtually, but I would put legitimate numbers here. And then where do I want to stage my subspindle when I'm done? So, so usually I'll send the subspindle all the way back or just about back to the extent of the travel so I have the maximum amount of clearance between my two spindles. If it's a production and I'm a larger machine and I don't have to go all the way back, I want to save some time, then you can start to truncate everything up. You just want to be careful with clearance because, you know, those heads, they're of a decent size. So, you know, if you're sitting at a B0 location and you're going to come all the way down to maybe bore a hole, you got to accommodate not only the projection distance of the tool, but that whole head. So just be careful. You know, that's where clearances become a little tight. Okay, so we accept it. Our header page is in. Now we're going to get to our first turning operation. So looking at our content, we're going to just do a simple OD turn. Nothing all that complicated. We're going to machine from the 100 millimeter OD down to a 50 millimeter OD. You're now going to see that even in something as simple as a stock removal OD turning cycle, you have that beta and the gamma fields available for you. That's what's going to let you drive around the orientation, and the system's automatically going to manage it. So what would happen is this cycle off of the tool change would apply that orientation angle that I want to rotate it to. Then she would come down to the start point and begin machining. So that wouldn't happen after the, the tool's already been positioned down. And we're just going to be driving that base orientation of the turning tool. So here, we're probably going to do it at a B0 location and then machine it. And then we can kind of flip it around so you can see that. So let's add this into our program. Now I'm going to bring up the print just so you can kind of use it for your own reference. And what we're doing is we're machining this area. So if you look at view A on the right side, we're just turning this 100 millimeter blank or raw stock down to a 50 millimeter OD. So I'm just going to go to turning, pick my stock removal, and I'm going to do my basic stock removal. I want to grab an appropriate tool. So here I'm going to use my right-handed OD turning tool. And then you come in, and these are the new fields. So how do I want to drive my, my B axis? Do I want to just tell it, hey, go to B0? Do I want to tell it to figure the figure's angle? Do I want to swing it all the way down? And then what do I want to do for the spindle? And you see when I highlight it, the spindle or the gamma field goes yellow. So here I can type in a value, or I can choose the preset 0 or 180. So you're going to pick any one of these. And if you 
don't quite have your head around it, don't worry, try it. Simulation is going to catch you if you chose a solution that's not workable. The rest of the cycle is the same as you guys have always used. Feeds, speeds, turning strategy, where am I starting, where am I going, depth per cut, you know, all the normal stuff. So we accept it. And now, as we start to simulate a run, we're going to see our, our turning scenario. Now, the trick here is pay attention to the screw you see on the insert, because that gives you a reference of where things are positioned. Also, and I'm going to slow down my override, so I'll go a little slower. I'm going to take a look at the orientation, right? So this is a 55 degree insert with minimum relief, relief angle probably five or seven degrees. So you see that that insert was almost vertical against this back wall. So as you start to drive or control the B-axis, maybe I plug in a value of 45 and I simulate it, it's going to tell you whether or not it can get to that location. So if you choose a value too large for it to go to, so maybe I tell it a 10 or so, it's going to limit you or not. And then you can maybe flip some things around. So you'll control what you want to do based on these values. Now, if I want to totally flip the tool around, right? So I'm going to go to 90 and go to 180. That's going to turn the tool upside down and, and move it around for me. And again, watch that. I don't see the screw anymore because now I'm flipped over. So you can kind of get an idea even visually here in simulation on whether or not you see that little, that little screw detail based on what position that spindle is in. So play around with it. You know, if you, if you think that, you, you know, you don't quite have your head around the orientation, don't be afraid to fool around with it. Simulation will catch if you've chosen a solution that's not viable or not possible. Okay. So I'm going to go back to a base zero location, and that's just holding the tool sitting at 9 o'clock. And now we're going to go and take a look at a simple transfer. I'm going to minimize that. So we turned it, and now we want to do a transfer. So the transfer is going to be the same as you've seen up to now, um, just including a beta and a gamma field. So this is really allowing you the option of telling it where you want to swing that B axis during the transfer method. So like I said earlier, uh, clearances, they're tight in these machines. So when I send the machine up to its clearance position, which is going to be the machine location found right here in the cycle, I may need to position that B. And if I know I'm going to immediately take that tool and come down and work on the subspindle, maybe I want to position it to 180. Right? I can I can have it swung there, let it do the transfer, and now I come straight down and start doing the turning, and the tool's already over there. Or I can let it handle it in the cycle. Other than that, it's the same exact process. The G55, that's handling everything for me as far as once I get to the counter spindle, so I don't have to worry about that. So this is just going to be driving that initial location during the transfer. Once I tell it to start to transfer, it's going to be a standard pick and place in this example. So Chuck's going to come over, counter spindle, grab my part. Um, basically, my jaws would just be touching. So I probably have a little bit of index offset between the two jaws. Clamp it, bring her back to that Z2W or safety location that was stipulated in the header page. And then we're going to go in and we're going to start to machine the other side. Now, it's important when you start to methodize the the, the counter or the subspindle operations that you remember that you're still always programming everything as if it was in the main spindle. The G55, the mirrored offsets handling everything. So when it comes to the beta and the gamma fields, think of it as if you're on the main spindle. The system will automatically orient the B axis, orient the spindle, and handle the Z direction for you. So it'll also handle the direction of the spindle of the subspindle, because that may have to spin backwards. It calculates all that for you. You don't have to think anything that, about that. Just always picture that you're driving all the data as if you were sitting on that main spindle. So let's plug that operation in. There's two operations in this case. So when I get to the various fields, I want to go to my counter spindle option. 
Here, if I want to control the positions, I can plug the values in. Then the rest of this is going to be the same as I normally would for a pick and place. Where do I want to send the machine as a safety location? Where am I sending the live tool in this case of so the milling spindle for my transfer? Flushing coolant, what directions are my two spindles running in, what RPM, how far onto the part am I going, what's the reduced feed location, what is the reduced feed rate. If I want to travel to a fixed stop, do I want to apply pressure? Am I drawing the part out? Am I using a cutoff cycle? Again, we're just doing a pick and place. What's the work coordinate that I'm going to use once I get to the sub spindle? Very, very important. And am I describing the secondary work offset? And here, I like to use the describe method. You don't have to. You could pre-stage it. But the system, as long as I set up my chucks properly, it'll do those calculations for me. So I don't have to think about that. And referencing that previous webinar, go back and check it out if you haven't seen it, because I talk about this in a lot of detail. And we really start to show you how those numbers get calculated. It's pretty cool. So what's my overall blank? It knows how much it's going to be sticking out by how much I throwed it on. So I'm sticking out 75 mil. And where do I want to send the subspinal when I'm done? And you don't have to go back to where the header page says. This is what's controlling where I'm going to go to after the transfer. So we transfer our part. Now we're going to do a simple turn. But I'm going to be doing this left side of the feature. And I do have a chamfer here. So I'm going to still use the stock removal cycle, but I'm going to use the one with chamfers. And if you look, I'm using a B0 and a gamma zero orientation. Typical geometry, right? I'm machining from 100 down to 50, 50 mil back. I'm just putting a chamfer of 10 mil in this back corner. And then what's my depth of cut? You know, normal stuff. Now, for this to work properly, the system actually has to jump over and automatically orient that spindle for me and that, and that um, B axis orientation to 180. And that's going to automatically be handled. So there's our basic turn. I see the insert uh, screw. So I know where I'm sitting as far as the B0 and the spindle orientation. There's our transfer. And now you see how I don't see the insert screw anymore. And the spindle, the counter spindle, is actually running in reverse. System handled all that for you just by using the mirrored work offset and allowing us to track the beta and the gamma. If you were to do all this with B-axis positions and positioning the spindle, you can start to see how complicated this becomes. Well, you know, what direction do I have to run the spindle in? Am I, am I inverted? Am I not? System's tracking all that for us. All right. So now let's start to get to some little more intricate or interesting type of features. Now let's do some milling. So when I come to the milling cycle, you're going to notice there is no beta and no gamma. Because based on the orientation of the geometry, I tell it, is it on my face? Is it on my peripheral surface? That's how we're going to know how to stage the B-axis. And I don't need to know the gamma because the tool's spinning, right? So that one's obviously easy. So depending on the configurations I've used before, you may or may not have seen the face Y function. Face B is something new. We're going to keep that for a little later in this session because that's what's going to allow me to handle my incline planes. So just as simple as picking either a face C or face Y strategy, face C would give you C-axis motion for milling this, this slotting tool path. Face Y would hold the main spindle stationary, whichever spindle I'm, I'm running, shall I say, stationary, and use the Y-axis of, uh, of the machine to machine between X and Y, machining this tool path. And then, obviously, if I needed to go into the peripheral or the outside of the part, I'm either going to use the peripheral C or the sheath Y. And we're going to see that in the next operation. And then here, we're just doing a standard slotting cycle, open slotting cycle. So I'm going to add that to my first stop. Because if we look at our part print, we see that the slot is actually on the right side. And what I'm going to do as well to keep from doing the transfer, because we're going to add a few operations to this main side and kind of let the other stuff get pushed down. I'm just going to put a quick little G-code line in of a program stop. <clears throat> this way, I don't have to worry about simulating the entire process the whole time. We can kind of work on the part, get that stuff done, and then I can jump over to finishing off the back section of it. Go to milling. 
go to slotting and select an open slot. Now the tool, I'm going to choose a tool that's pointing towards my zero, but I'm always going to point that because again, the axis is going to handle swinging that tool down. So all my drills and my end mills should always be built, unless I have some kind of right angle head in there, should be built towards the B0 location or that nine o'clock position. You notice there again, there is no beta or gamma here because everything is being driven based on what I choose. All right? Am I working on the outside surface? Am I working on the face? And that's where the system will do its calculations from. The rest of this is just going to be standard. You know, where's the center? What, um, what's my, my, my technology or my, my toolpath strategy? Climb mill, conventional mill? Am I just doing one slot, multiple? Now, the C orientation position, that becomes important. Um, this is how I can kind of clock where the slot is. So I'm going to have this slot be at, at, at C0, basically. So it's going to machine a slot straight up and down. And then I've got to think about that later with my other features, right? I've got a couple flats i got to put on this part and some drilled holes, and they're 90 degrees off the slot. So you just got to pay attention to that. But that's how I can kind of clock the feature around. The rest of this is just your center, right? Center of it, top of the part, length and width of my slot. So 16 mil wide, 50 mil long, something just a little bit greater than. Angle of orientation if I need to, depth, this would be my radial engagement, my, my spiral step over, I'm doing a 30% cutter diameter engagement. Depth for pass, so I'm taking it, this one, just taking all one cut. Do I want to leave any material for a finished cut? So if we simulate it, we're now going to see the first turn feature, and we're going to see the machine slot come in play. Now I'm going to look at 3D here, give you a little bit of rotation. I'm using a base Y strategy, so you're not going to see the, the spindle orientating or the C-axis orientating. If I use the face C, then the Y-axis would be held stationary. And we get our slot. And the system calculated the B0 position because it knows based on the location of the slot. Now, it didn't move on because I got my program stop. If I hit cycle start again, it would have continued on and done the transfer and moved on through the program. So for us, the next feature is going to naturally be to face off these two flats. So not only do I have the flats created, but I can uh, drill or maybe tap or whatever I'm doing, uh, some holes on these flats. So just like you saw before, no beta, no gamma. I'm going to just choose the appropriate location. Now when you use the face mill cycle, you don't have the peripheral C option because of the nature of a facing operation is it's flat. It's not wrapped around a radius the way a pocket could be. So pocket, you're going to see either the sheath Y, which is using the Y axis of the machine, or the peripheral C. But when you get the face mill, you only get the sheath Y. So you won't even see or have the ability to doing a face mill operation on the peripheral if you have a machine that doesn't have a Y axis. I have yet to see a B-axis lathe that didn't have a Y-axis. These are generally the, the big daddies, right, of all the machines. So they're going to have all the functionality. In our case, we're going to chain or we're going to create two face mill cycles. And they're just going to be 180 degrees apart. First one starting at an index of 90 because I want it clocked 90 degrees off that slot. And the slot was at zero. And then the next one, when I look at it, it's going to just be a mirror image of the other one, and it's going to be 180 out. And what I also want to do is I want to make sure that I gate my facing cycle so I don't overcut here. So we're going to use a basic position um, and then tell it to limit the overall location. So back into our program, I'm going to insert below open slot. So I just want to make sure my highlight's sitting on open slot. I'm going to go to milling, I'm going to go to face milling. I don't have to keep telling the tool. Obviously, that's, that's redundant. Um, but if I start to move things around, it's kind of nice to have the tool in there because I don't have to remember what was modally loaded. So it's kind of up to you. Speeds and speeds, all the same. Position of it. So remember I said you don't see the uh, peripheral C here because the nature of a facing cycle has got to be flat. And that can't be flat. That's wrapped around a radius. But I could do a face in the Y or a face in the B. 
All right, so here, but all the facing cycles require a y-axis to be there. Make sure I limit the depth, right? So my x is going to go up and down. My z is back and forth, so that's in the z direction. And the y is across the part. Where do I want my first position to be? Probably 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Now the back edge, according to my print, if I look at it, this back edge is 50 millimeters back. So I'm just saying, hey, I'm going to start 50 mil back, and I'm leaving a little bit on my, my Y. So we're going to say 50 mil on one side. My X is going to be my location, but this isn't diametric. This is, this is radial when you get to milling cycles. So if I got a diameter of 40 mil, then the finished surface is actually at 20, and the rough surface, because it's cylindrical, is actually out at 25. So I want to start at 25, and then later we're going to end at 20. And then how far over do I want to go in my y-axis? 100 mil should be fine. That's why I'm giving it 50, 50 mil on either side. But I don't need another 50 mil off of the uh, z0, which is the face. So I can just come back 50 mil from my negative. That's going to do a feature that starts at this back edge and comes out. And again, I am limiting my depth by this field. Step over, depth for cut. We'll just take it all at once. One shot. We can go right back to the facing cycle. Actually, I'm just going to copy mine. And we'll paste it in and open it up. And now I can give it just the 270. And as long as I made all my numbers right on the first one, I should get two flats. Okay, so we see there's our slot. Now we're going to index 90 degrees. And you can start machining across. Since I gated the surface, it's going to try to always start at the furthest point away, hence why it's starting out in the Z positive, even though I gave it the dimensions working backwards. Doesn't really matter. Six of one half dozen of the other. And we get our two flats. And we get our two flats. 90 degree, or 180 degrees opposed and 90 degrees off of the slot. Sometimes you kind of get confused where where C0 is. So I even find myself just let's get some geometry in and kind of get my head around where this whole thing's falling. And then if I have to, I can index things 90 degrees from each other. If I was hit cycle start again, she would continue on with the transfer and the machining of the back op. So now once I get some flats there. Now we can actually drill some holes. And here I'm going to use the, um, the, the standard drilling cycles, the live tool drilling cycles that are in the control. We are going to link events just like you would in the lower technology machines. The big thing here is paying attention to the strategy I'm choosing. So is it face? Is it peripheral? Is it sheath? And making sure I carry the same strategy through from my can cycle to my position locations. If you mix these up, these things won't chain anymore. And it, the position patterns always have to chain. So make sure that we remember to do that. So transitioning over to sinew train, we're going to continue on with this example. Let me bring up our, our print so we can see that. So what we're doing is we're doing basically four drilled holes. We're only actually drilling two per surface. So um, it's hard to, I'm sure it's hard for you guys to see. Uh, two of these are, are hidden, hidden lines or hidden holes. Um, so they're, they're the exact same two hole locations and the nature of us flipping the part over puts the, the next positions. Um, it looks like from the top view with the hidden view that you have four holes, but we actually only have two. So that's what we're going to be plugging into. We're going to be doing this top hole and that lower left hole, and we'll do them again on the opposing surface. So below face milling, I want to set up a drilling cycle. I'm just going to do a standard drill ream. Certainly this could be a peck drilling or one of the other many cycles we have. Uh, according to the print, I'm doing a six millimeter hole, 10 millimeters deep. So I'm choosing a drill. 
six millimeter drill. Again, it was commissioned <coughs> or created, pointing to B. The system's automatically going to flip the, the B axis down 90 degrees for me to drill these holes. Speeds and speeds, I'm not too worried about it. In this case, you're going to put something a little more accurate when you create your real part. Now, do I want to position with the Y axis or do I want to position with the C? So in my case, I have holes that are off center, right? They're offset to the center line, so I have to position in Y. And just remember this option, because it's important to reflect this when we get to the position screen. How am I drilling? Depth, a couple other standard, excuse me, a couple other standard options, and I accept. We get the normal open bracket, so it means we gotta link it to something. I gotta link it to my positions. I'm gonna use some random holes. And this is where I mentioned you have to choose the same strategy. You notice if I choose the wrong strategy, they don't link together. So it's important to use the same strategy and just carry it through. So what position am I starting to drill from? We said before that, that bottom flat surface was at 20 millimeters radially. So that's why I'm using a X020. What's the orientation position of the first set of holes? So it's 90 degrees. First location, that's going to be this top hole. So I'm seven millimeters offset in the Y. I see that dimensionally right here. And I'm 15 millimeters back in the Z. Next hole is seven millimeters in the positive, and I'm back 30 millimeters. So I just have those two holes. I hit accept. Now they link because I have the appropriate strategy. I do another random set of holes. Put this at 270, accept. And I should have all four holes. System automatically driving that tool down to a B axis 90 position and drilling my four holes. So let's take a look at that. Here comes our flats. Certainly need flats before we can drill holes on the flats. The machine's going to drive to a tool change. Swings the B down. I even see the B here showing the 90 degrees. And then she's just sitting at my clearance position waiting for me to come up with another operation. All right. So that's how I'll start to handle some peripheral drilling. I can do face drilling as well. In fact, in our example, I want to plug a or put a 16 millimeter hole straight through this part. Now, in my case, to make it a little bit more interesting, I'm going to say that the drill that I'm using can cannot drill all the way through this 150 millimeter part. It's a 16 millimeter hole, so that's not a uh, uncommon scenario. So I'm going to drill, and I specifically chose to do this right around the transfer. So I want to drill from one side, half, a little over halfway through, then we're going to transfer the part, and we're going to, same tool, flip that spindle 180 degrees, finish drilling on the back side, and we'll get our through hole. Now, just to keep things a little bit more interesting, I decided to use the solid drill functions. You're going to get a chance to see how solid drills created. And then I'm going to use a centric drilling cycle because maybe in this case I want to actually hold the drill stationary and spin the main spindle or spin the sub spindle. I don't always have to use live tools, right? I can still use centric um, scenarios. It's kind of Six of one, half dozen the other. Really doesn't make any difference either way. But the cycles are still there. So let's take a look at that. So back here after my positions, I'm going to want to go to drilling and go to my centric, which is my first option up, right? The rest of these cycles down below, these are all live tool cycles, right? So it's going to run the milling spindle. The centric is going to run the main spindle holding the tool rigid in the other location. My tool is going to be a solid drill. Now, the solid drill, when building a solid drill, let me just get to a new location. You're not going to see it in the favorites. 
So if, if you're looking for something you don't find in the favorites, go and drill down into the different cutter options. Under drill, I see solid drill. So what's the difference between a solid drill and a twist drill? So solid drill, you can still run live. Um, this is being really referred to as what we like to call an insert style drill. And the biggest thing is the solid drill, sorry, the solid drill doesn't force you to put an angle value in because it's assuming that it's got a flat bottom. So if I have a, a tool that's flat bottom drill, I like to use a solid drill. It just keeps me from having to plug in the numbers to kind of mimic a flat bottom, right? Other than that, it's a standard drill. So diameter, projection from the spindle face out to the tool tip. Now, it's centric. So in the centric cycle, it can only ever allow this to drill at a B0 or a B180 location. So we don't have the ability of flipping to a peripheral surface or anything because centric, the nature of centric, it's spinning the spindle. The tool is being held stationary. So we fill out the rest of the cycle as normal. How deep am I going? If I want to use pack, what would be my max pack? I'm taking it all in one shot. I'm going to get rid of the program stop because I don't need it anymore. We're going to do the transfer, and I'm going to simply copy and paste the centric drilling. I'm not going to do anything different because the work coordinate is going to handle where it's going to drive this tool to do it. So if I look at it now, we're going to get a hole on both the face and then we come back. Now, a quick little trick, I can do Control-M to speed up my simulation and then speed it back down by hitting Control-M again. So now I can just get my partial drilled hole, do my transfer, and there's my rest of my drilled hole, and then she's going to come down and she's going to finish turning the part. We can look at this in a half-cut view. And we can rerun it to give you guys a little different perspective. So we're turning it. I'm going to kick up the speed a little bit with Control M. Now we're drilling our peripheral holes. Now our tool is going to come in. So there's our partial drill just past 80 mil. We do our transfer over. And now we're doing the rest. There would be our blend. Finish up. Good. So we're getting there. We're just about done. We're, we're over at this side of things. So now we've got some interesting stuff. We're going to get a chance to see how do I handle inclined planes. And that's really where I want to get to, right? Because I've got a B-axis lathe, so I want to use features that are going to allow me to take advantage of the B-axis lathe. So looking at our slides, once I get to inclined planes, I need to start to understand a little bit what we mean by the swivel cycle or cycle 800. Swivel cycle or cycle 800 does two key features or functions for me. It allows me to create an inclined plane and then set my tool normal orientation to that plane. Or it allows me to drive the orientation of the tool, but it's not going to move the work coordinate system. And really, that's the difference between the left option, the left feature you see on the left side, or the right side. What happens to the work coordinate system? Is the work coordinate staying, staying, station staying fixed, and it's just changing the orientation and managing the orientation of the tool? That's what's happening with the beta and the gamma. Excuse me, that should have been on silent. That's what's happening with the beta and the gamma fields, right? That's really doing that orientation of tool option. If I want to create a plane and then have my Z plane be normal to that surface or Z orientation be perpendicular to the plane, and then the tool automatically aligned to that plane, I'm going to use the orientation of the machine. And that's what we call our swivel cycle. So the swivel cycle allows me to do a couple things. It allows me to move the zero around linearly. It allows me to rotate the zero, and then it allows me to move the zero around again on this new rotated plane. And at the end, when it's all said and done, the tool is going to be sitting perpendicular to that surface. And my Z is now going to be coming straight up from the surface. The Z is no longer going to be on the face of the part. And this is what we call 
swiveling with the swivel cycle instead of orientating the tool. So for our example, we want to create a plane. So we're going to use the swivel cycle feature. And I'm going to move my zero around a little bit too. So when I look at this, maybe for those of us that have um, seen or used the Cycle 800 on a more of a, a milling type of configuration or variation, very, very similar fields. Actually, there's a couple things that get pulled out of here that you would have over on the mill side, but pretty much it's, it's almost identical. So I can do a tool change. I can do a retract strategy. Here, this is unique. I can clock or orientate the C position. You wouldn't obviously have that in a milling machine, but I would have it on a turn mill. So that's where I can kind of spin my C around, just like you've been seeing in the other cycles, where how do I position my ski for that feature? The linear shift, the X, 0, Y, 0, Z, 0, that's a linear staging of the work coordinate system. So it's, it's doing that normal to the original coordinate system of the part. Then my swivel mode, and my swivel method is now going to allow me to start to rotate things around. So now I can rotate my, or create a plane. And then once I've created the plane, or rotated, I can then shift my zero along that plane. So in our case, we're going to drill a hole in the center of the plane that we make. All right, if we looked at our print again, we have two 45 degree surfaces, we drill a couple holes in them. So here I can shift things around once I'm all done. What's happening? Well, if I can picture my work coordinate system, and here you have a little coordinate cube displayed. Initially, before I start the swivel cycle, right, my X and Z is front center of my part, where it normally would be on any lathe. Y is center as well. So this first shift of 10 millimeters in X is really just going to slide the zero up to that corner that I want to pivot on. Right, that's going to be the corner of my plane. And I know that because I have a known dimension on my print. It's important that you would have that value on your print. Now I want to rotate the coordinate system. And I want to rotate, in my case, simply around the y-axis. And I'm rotating in a plus direction. So that's why I have a plus value in the y field of 45 degrees. So the result of that is now your coordinate system is sitting still on that corner of the surface. But now my z is, is normal to or perpendicular to this new inclined plane. Now, last but not least, and I don't have to do this, but sometimes it makes it easier later, I'm going to stage the zero by sliding the workhorn system up this new created plane. In my case, we're going to move up the x-axis in a positive direction, 10 millimeters. So now, if I was to tell a tool, go to 000 for x, y, z, it should be touching that center point of that plane. That's where my new zero is at the time of this swivel function. From there, once I've swiveled in place, I can now use the facing cycle, and we're now going to get to use the face B function. So face B is referring to the B axis. And if you want to do anything in an inclined plane with a swivel cycle active, you need to use face B, because face Y or sheath Y is going to then negate this plane you just created and go back to the standard um, base orientation of the work coordinate system. So by selecting face B, we're saying apply this tool path to the plane that was just created. So I do have to have created a plane prior to this. So your operations, like you see here, you're going to have a swivel plane. And then once you've created the plane, tell it how you're cutting this. And this would be the same thing in G-code. You'll have a cycle 800, which is a swivel plane. And then you'll have a bunch of operations. And that could be just G0s, 1s, and 2s, whatever it takes to do that feature. But that's now active to the corresponding swivel plane. So we're going to do this for one side. And then we're going to chance to kind of flip it over and do the next side. But so let's get one surface in created. So I'm going to move my highlight below my stock removal, because certainly I would want to have turned this feature down prior to putting these two flats. And here you can see this is where I have some known values, right, in this uh, view A field. I know that the edge of my plane is 20 millimeters diametrically. We're in a kind of a more of a milling type of scenario. So this becomes a radial value. That's my I shift to 10 mil up. I got my 45 degrees, about my y axis. That's why we have a positive 45 in our y. And then if you look, I know the center line of the 
hole that I'm going to put in later is 10 millimeters off of that edge. So that's how I know to slide my 0, 10 millimeters up in my x-axis. Now, where a swivel plane exists, it's found under the various cycles, and you have a button called swivel plane. Now, the swivel plane, like I mentioned, there's two strategies, right? You have the swivel plane for creating planes, or you have the orientate tool. You do have an orient orientate tool option as well here. We were allowing it to all happen using the beta and the gamma fields in the cycle. If I'm not using a cycle, let's say, but I need to change the orientation of my tool and then come down and do something without moving my coordinate system, you could use the orientate mill tool. And in G-code, Cycle 800 has that same variation. So you can do an orientate mill tool with Cycle 800 as well in the G-code side or the swivel plane. We're choosing swivel plane. Now, here, I'm probably going to want to uh, grab the tool that I'm going to be using. So we're going to be using a 12 millimeter tool to mill this surface. So I'll let it do a tool change now. We've got a retract plane where I want to back up to when I'm done. Where am I orientating my C? I may not know this, so machine your first surface and see if everything seems to be aligned the way I want it. If not, you can clock it. I was sliding my X up 10. My Y wasn't changing, my Z wasn't changing, so that was putting me right at this corner, right at the pivot point. I'm doing a positive 45 degree rotation, and then I'm doing a final shift in my X, 10 millimeters up, positioning me to the center. Probably one of the biggest things you want to get your head around once you start programming this method is where's the coordinate system when you're all said and done. So if you can get your hands on a little coordinate cube, they're very, very helpful. But at the end of the day, just like we saw in our previous slide, the coordinate system is going to be sitting right here. So Z straight up, Y is across the part, and X plus is going kind of back towards the chuck. And that's important once we start putting in our physical cycle, in this case a milling face mill cycle, because I've got to kind of think about where the geometry is. So we've got 12 millimeter tool some speeds and feeds. I need to make sure I choose face B. I'm not worried about gating anything as far as my cutter path. Everything is kind of open around it, so I can leave that. And now we're going to choose our amount of, of, of kind of facing. So the center of this feature is 0, 0. So here, you know, how much in my X you know, do I really know? Well, I know that 10 millimeter gets me from the center of the bolt hole pattern, which probably is the center of the feature out. So I'm going to need at least 20 mil and center zero. So if I did maybe minus 15 and then later down here, I did 30, let's say, off of that um, back edge. So that's going to be back here. Remember, plus is up, all right? So minus 15 somewhere there. I'm going 30. That should be okay. My Y, maybe we'll go minus 25, and then we'll go 50 mil for the Y. Now, my Z, zero in this case, is something a little bit above. I don't necessarily know, so I can kind of guess. Uh, maybe I'll give it 5 mil. We'll see what that does. And I'm ending at... A value of zero. So, so the plane I created, that's establishing Z0 to be this surface. So I know I have some plus stock. How much do I have? I can mathematically calculate it. I'm not that worried. I'm going to give it some plus stock. I might, if it looks like it's taking too heavy a cut, I can give it a little more stock. In my case, I'm taking this all in one shot. So if we simulate it, and we'll kick it up a little faster here. All right, so there is our, up a little bit, she just transferred, I just drilled. Okay, so now we're on the back side. We're turning, and now we are going to get our swiveling cycle. I was just taking it all in one cup. Obviously, you would probably do this in a couple passes. And here I see the feature, just like I see on my print, is offset 90 degrees from these flats. So that's where I wanted it. So my C0 was a good strategy. So now we just got to get to the back side. So when we go to the back side, 
I'm just going to want to really just mimic that same exact thing, but now spin the coordinate system 180 degrees out. So we can uh, we can use um, we're going to have to create a new plane, right? So this is in the swivel plane, and then I'm just going to have a, a repeat of the same cycle, and that's what's going to spin it 180 degrees out for me. So I don't have to try to shift anything into the bottom. I can just pre-stage the part so she's sitting in a plus feature, and then I'm going to get my two flats. Oops, sorry. Uh, hold on one second. All right. Oops. Now, of course. Come here. All right. Give me one second here. All right. Let me just transition back. My computer had a little farfig in there. All right. So I'm going to continue with my uh, with my my milling of my inclined plane. So I really need these two events. So I'm going to just highlight them, copy them, and paste them. We're going to go back into the swivel plane, and I'm going to tell it to index the swivel plane 180 degrees. And this base mill feature can stay the same. I don't need to change anything. And now if we simulate, we should get both surfaces. So we start turning. I'm going to kick the speed a little bit. Transfer, there's our back op. Okay, we'll let it finish up here. All right, face. And there you see the position. So that's all being handled with that orientation of the C in the swivel cycle. And we can jump to either two surfaces. So we're almost done. We've just got a couple holes to put on the system or on this part, and then we're going to be done. So the next thing is going to be drilling and drilling in an inclined plane. Now, I intentionally kept this pretty easy. Certainly, there could be a whole bunch of holes in these surfaces. Um, but the key here is we're drilling on this surface, so anywhere on that surface that's created. So we're going to choose the drilling cycle, and now we're going to use the face B strategy. So whenever I want to do anything, milling, drilling, on an inclined plane, where I'm utilizing the B axis at a position other than 0 or 180, I use the face B option. But with that, I need to have created a swivel plane. So we're going to come in. We're going to um, choose our face B option once I've given it a swivel plane. And it will use the active swivel plane. Just be careful, if I'm driving tool change, that plane may or may not have been maintained. It's really up to the OEM when they go through their tool change macro if they're going to cancel the plane or keep it active. So if you don't know, I would defer to the alternate, which is I'd rather be redundant with my planes and from a safety perspective because I know I just sent it through a tool change. So we'll actually add a plane in ours. Come in. We're going to drill a hole. We're going to choose our um, location. And then we'll do our next hole. And here I'm just going to show you a quick little way of doing some repeat commands when I have some repetition, repetitious functionality, instead of having a whole bunch of copy and paste. So under the face mill, I do need to do a new plane. So I'm going to go back to my swivel plane. Um, now, I could keep it at 180, because that's already staged. That was the last one I was working on. And then jump back to zero. That's OK. I just want to make sure I have the plane. Pick a drilling strategy. Now my part, if I look at my call out for my eight millimeter hole, I do want to um, probably in this plane, yeah, I'm sorry. I do want to call out my eight millimeter drill. Again, created pointing towards uh, Z, B0. Retract, orientation, location. So all this stuff stays the same. All right? I don't have to change anything else because this is now establishing a zero at the center of this hole that I want to I want to drill. So we accept it. From there, we're going to use our cycle. And I'm just going to do a basic cycle, eight millimeter. I know my depth is in my call out, uh, which it looks like it's 20 millimeters deep here. And I want to make sure I use the face B. 
that's important, right? And then I want to go to my position locations. I can just do some random locations. I'm going to choose face B. Now, the Z0, Z is perpendicular to the surface. So Z0 is going to be the top of this plane, which is where I want to drill from. And my, my location for my drilling is 0, 0. I don't have any other positions, so I can zero them out. So that's going to drill one hole right on this surface. Now, when you start to get to some of those rep repetitious events, it's sometimes it's nice to not have to keep copying and pasting and maintaining the same geometry in multiple events. So that's a, that's a scenario where I like to use the repeat command. Now, the repeat command, you can use all kinds of different markers to tell it where to go to. Probably one of the easiest things to do is to go in uh, to your edit function, go to your renumbering option, and give yourself some end numbers. So once I plug in some end numbers, I have some automatic point locations. So what do I need to do? Well, I need to do a new swivel plane back to zero. So we're going to do a swivel plane back to zero. But now I really need to just re redo these two events, N180 and 190. And let me just do a, oops, I'm going to renumber, I'll get a number on that one too, so they're all the same. So if I do a quick little G code line, type the word repeat, space, and what end numbers I want to repeat between. If you wanted to just do one, you'd have to just duplicate the number twice. In my case, I want to go N180 to N190. And now we should get holes on both sides. Um, another way with sequence numbers that's real handy is if you want to use go-tos. You know, like I could add a go-to in the beginning of this program and jump really over all this first op stuff um, and allow me to just pick up at the, the back side. But here, let's just run it across, speed it up a little bit so that we're doing our turning. There's our inclined mill plane, right, the first plane. We're going to spin it. Now, since I drilled at 180, it shouldn't spin again. It should just come right down. Drill my hole. There's my drilled hole. There's my next drilled hole. And if I did my job properly in my position and my depth, we should break through. We should get a nice little breakthrough. So I'm going to do a cut view. Let's cut it right there. And there we see a cross hole came through, broke through. It did not dig on the other side. This is just the breakthrough there, so it looks like my numbers were good. All right, so just about done. Uh, I can unactivate the cut for now. So our final operation, looking at the print, is I have some holes, but it's kind of like a bolt-to routine on an inclined plane. So that gets a little different. So right now, if I was to use a standard bolt hole on this surface, it would be working around the surface, but we do have an option to kind of rotate around. So I can create a plane and rotate it around. So from there, oops, sorry. I want to go back to my PowerPoint, that one. From here, looks like the the feed is slowing down a little bit. Interesting, let's get a chance to catch up. Oh, my WebEx is a little slow today. All right, sorry about that. We have, and now we got a mouse back. Okay. It was interesting. Slight technical difficulty. <laughs> All right, so we're going to swivel cycle. We're going to do a drilling operation. We're going to use a face B, but we're not going to drill just on the plane we create. We're actually going to use a C axis rotation option. So here I can use a face B drilling strategy with a face B selection in my bolt hole routine, but I can say with C, and that allows me to then basically transfer that all the way around this bolt hole pattern. So this is going to be the last feature we add. So back in Sydney Train, we're now going to 
create a final plane. And what's going to happen is this plane is actually going to be back here on the surface. So I got to do a little bit of a little bit more motion here because this is where I'm going to actually create my new zero. It's going to be back on this surface. So we go to swivel plane. I'm going to still use an 8 mil tool, so I can leave that in. That's fine. I retract. But now I'm not bringing my X up to 10, this corner. I'm bringing it all the way up to this surface, which is 25 mil out, right? So I'm going to give it a positive 25. My shift back is going to be back to this corner. So I'm sliding my zero back. Z is still pointed straight out from the surface. 40 mil. And that's going to be a negative 40 mil in Z. All right. So she comes back. Then I'm going to do a rotation of 45 degrees positive. Puts my X, Y, Z coordinates right here. So X is moving back to the surface. Z is now perpendicularly out off the surface. Y is across the part. And I want to do a final shift to get to the center of my bolt hole for my print of positive 7 mil in X. That's going to plug that X, Y, Z coordinate system right there on that bolt hole location. And then from there, we can start our feature. So zero is in location. I'm going to drill. I'm just going to do a basic drill ream. I'm going to still be using a face B because I have an inclined plane. I want to take a look at my depth. Depth's a little deeper now. It's 45 mil per the print. What is going on here? Boy, that is awfully slow. Sorry about that, guys. I'm not sure what's going on with my, my feed is an issue. Okay, so I have my, my drilling enabled. Now I want to go to my position screen. I'm going to do a bolt hole pattern. I got to still use a face B strategy, but now I want to use a width C axis as, as, as opposed to on plane. If I use on plane, that's going to give me a flat bolt hole pattern, keeping the C stationary. If I use with C, now it's going to position around. Then I just plug in, you know, where am I starting? Where's my Z datum? It's, it's zero in this case. Where's my X, Y, zero is going to be the center of my bolt hole. Angle of my first location, and then how many do I want to do? And if we're right, we should now have a finished part. Okay, so it turns. We'll let it simulate the whole thing, just give you a refresher of all the ops. Slots. We're going to do our first peripheral face. This is actually a face Y or sheath Y, right? Or peripheral milling, but we want to use an X and Y motion. We need X around. We face off the next segment. I'm going to increase our speed a little bit, we'll go to 100%. Drill our holes, drill through, back turn, there's our first surface, second surface, drill, drill, and there is your bolt hole pattern wrapped around. So as a recap, Really, the biggest thing from a technology side to kind of get your head around is, is where's the orientation of B in the spindle? Then from there, how do I drive it? So we're going to start to use our beta and our gamma fields to rotate things around. Always mess it up, methodize everything as if it's on the main spindle. The mirrored work coordinate will handle all that. And when I want to get to my inclined planes, I need to use the swivel cycle. And once I use the swivel cycle, any of the cycles I want to use, I have to then do a face B option to allow that, that cycle to work on this new inclined plane. Other than that, you're going to find this is going to drive very, very similar to a standard, a standard lathe. So with that being said, that concludes our topic for today. 
I want to thank everybody for taking the time out to, um, to view or watch this seminar, and I hope to see you again real soon.